the decade half of us can hardly imagine. Some will call it the good old glory days, but one thing that crosses my mind and many others, how the glory days was just a perfume for bullshit. But not everything in South Central Los Angeles. Between the early 1900s and the 1940s has seen its biggest rise of Black African Americans who's fleeing from the horrid conditions from the South and also areas like Texas. South Central Los Angeles back then was a gold mine for African Americans. Crap. We were not even allowed to study nursing in the county's training schools. But work was plentiful. And almost any job was better than following a plow in the South. You might start at the bottom, but could rise to the top. Some of us entered the profession. Others managed to open their own businesses. We were proud of these thriving black-owned businesses, and we were proud of their proprietors. But today, it's hard to even imagine it was even worth something in the first place. It was a precious gift to be in a peaceful and growing community. Everyone was thriving, and improvement of life for everyone seemed to be on the horizon. Jobs were plentiful, and in South Central LA, 33% of Black Americans owned their home. South Central was thriving, even through segregation and racism. The black community invested in their own and was succeeding, and that was until the 1940s, when the Great Depression started. An influx of over 40,000 African Americans flooded South Central Los Angeles, hoping for a better life. Against all judgment, they flooded the city, overwhelming the community's resources. No one could cope. Central Avenue began to die. During the recovery stages of the Depression and mass migration to the city, many of the Black middle and upper class families left due to the issues in the once thriving city. South Central Los Angeles in 1936, John Floyd Thomas Jr. was unfortunately born. Little is known about his childhood. His mother passed away when he was 12 years old, and he was left in the care of his grandmother and aunt. He attended public schools and graduated from Manual Arts High School in South Central Los Angeles. He then joined the United States Air Force in 1956. John was stationed at the Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, but got into trouble quickly. According to his superiors, he was always late and rarely appeared groomed. John Floyd Thomas Jr., while in the Air Force, was accused of raping a lady in South Central Los Angeles and attempting to rape another woman five days later on a separate night in March of 1957. In just a year, after enrolling in the Air Force, he also allegedly attempted to rape an elderly woman on West 35th Place in Los Angeles. But her pleas were thankfully heard. The woman's son-in-law came to her rescue and ended up shooting John. Injured John managed to flee, and as a result of that injury and eyewitnesses, he was apprehended after only a month on the run. Police had arrested him for attempted rape. Despite this, a lenient Los Angeles County prosecutor offered Thomas a plea bargain and just charged him with burglary. He was sentenced to six years in the California State Jail on a much reduced burglary conviction and was just disarmedly discharged from the Air Force. According to some reports, Thomas sought work as a social worker following his release from jail. We can only imagine what John was not caught with during these intense crime waves. As we just saw in a previous video on the boiling pot of chaos that was happening in Los Angeles at the time, between post-war conflicts, police corruption, drug epidemic, gang violence, racism, politics, and economic downturns. Since the Elizabeth Short, dubbed the Black Dahlia, was recovered in California in 1947, 
Following that, a registry was established for sex offenders who were required to register with the state from where they originated. Now, you would think that these offenders would be watched very closely, but unfortunately, not so. Only about a quarter are under parole oversight under a direct supervision. Most are left to their own devices. Having a vast number of offenders on the registry, Diane Webb, a detective of Los Angeles Police Department, was in charge of the Registration Enforcement and Compliance Team, the team known as REACT were founded in 2006 and are responsible for registering convict sex offenders, collecting DNA samples, monitoring offenders, and preparing criminal investigations for failing to register. Unfortunately, this fantastic endeavor did not come fast enough. John Floyd Thomas Jr. was not technically qualified to be placed on the sex offenders registry due to not being convicted for alleged assault of his victims in 1957, but for a burglary, so he was free to do anything he wanted. His most heinous atrocities are said to have begun in the early of 1970s. On September 20th, 1975, his next victim was discovered, Cora Perry, 79, of Lennox, a tiny neighborhood near Inglewood, California. She was found deceased, she was raped and strangled. It was assumed that John broke into the victim's kitchen through the window because when the investigators arrived, they discovered that the screen had been taken from the window and placed on the ground below. Because DNA analysis tools were unavailable at the time, it is hardly unexpected that this case had gone unresolved for decades to come. The following year, on February 16th, Elizabeth McCohen, a retired school administrator, returned home from an event at Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. Later that evening, a witness saw someone driving Elizabeth's car radically near her home. The witness also heard sounds of dragging coming from her apartment for 30 minutes. No neighbors alerted authorities about the disturbing sounds or erratic driving. According to these statements from neighbors, we don't want to get involved. On February 19th, Elizabeth was reported missing. Her half-naked body was found in her 1965 Chevrolet, which was parked not far from her small apartment in a neighborhood between Fox Hills and Westchester. His confidence in his killings was so strong that he even came back to the neighborhood, as were Cora Perry. His second known victim was located in April 1976, when a woman named Maybelline Huston was found murdered in her garage. She was raped and strangled. The media dubbed John West Side Strangler, and the LAPD formed a task team to investigate his atrocities. The task team had four suspects, one which was Brandon Tomer, a 19-year-old African-American serial killer, a man who was subsequently convicted of raping 12 to 34 different elderly people in their houses in 1976. For a while, he was decided to be the West Side Strangler, but it came out that Brandon Bomer, M.O., was different. You see, John Thomas' calling card was placing pillows or pillowcases near the victim after smothering or strangling them, but Brandon Bomer's M.O. was different. Brandon's M.O. was setting the victim's house on fire and killing the victim's cats. When arrested, the killings didn't stop, and unfortunately, the West Side Strangler Task Force felt like their job was done, so they quietly stepped away and disbanded the task force in 1976. Undoubtedly, the task of the determined culprit behind each murder proved exceedingly challenging for the detectives at the time. Particularly, considering the infant stage of DNA analysis, despite their best efforts, the detectives faced immense difficulties in linking specific victims to their killers. Regrettably, their best efforts fell short as John Thomas would later be connected to two additional murders. A little over two months later, in June of 1976, Morel McKinley, 65, was discovered brutally beaten and strangled in her garage. Subsequently, on October 29, 1976, Evelyn Bunner, age 56, was found murdered. Her lifeless body was slumped in the front seat of her car. 
Her gown was disheveled with the back unzipped and pulled up to her waist, exposing the horrifying extent of the beating she endured in her final moments. Los Angeles experienced a temporary respite from John's reign of terror when one of the many victims miraculously survived a brutal attack. In 1978, Gary Sterling, a resident of Pasadena, attended a lecture at Pasadena Cedar College. Later that evening, when Gary Sterling's mother, a retired social worker, returned home around 10.15 p.m., she was assaulted by an intruder, later identified as John Thomas. Wearing gloves, he attempted to strangle her, snapping her ankle and subjecting her to a savage rape before leaving her for dead. Miraculously, her strong will to live propelled her to reach out for help, summoning her loving son, Gary, to her side. She survived the vicious assault, but the haunting image of her mangled foot with the white tibia and fibula protruding would forever haunt Gary's memory. He vividly recalled, I will never forget seeing the white tibia and fibula sticking out. He damn near ripped her foot off. Thanks to the vigilance of his mother and concerned neighbors, it was revealed that one of the neighbors had observed a suspicious vehicle earlier that day, prompting them to note down the license plate number. The license plate was traced back to John Floyd Thomas Jr. When the police conducted a search of his 1973 Blue Four Mustang, they discovered a dark clothing, a ski mask, and providing substantial evidence that ultimately led to his conviction for this crime. In an inexplicable turn of events, a woman named Coletta Webb made an ill-advised decision to marry John Floyd while he was in the midst of facing assault charges. Despite his ongoing trial for his heinous crimes involving the brutal breaking of an individual's ankle in a vicious rape, Coletta Webb agreed to marry John on April 5th of 1978. However, justice prevailed when on August 17th, 1978, a jury found John guilty of rape and burglary and mayhem, and specifically for the horrendous act snapping of Miss Sterling's leg. Astonishingly, he received a mere five years prison sentence for this devastating attack. To John, this relatively short period of incarceration did not impede progress or outright alter his facade as an ordinary individual. Although the details of his employment as the social worker remains unclear, after his release in 1983, he relocated to Chino Hills in San Bernardino County and took on the role as a hospital peer counselor at Pomona Hospital. It is crucial to emphasize that a convicted rapist, particularly one with a history of violence, managed to secure employment in a hospital environment that included a significant number of vulnerable elderly women let that sink in. In the same year as a series of attacks targeting elderly women commenced in Claremont, a nearby town in Los Angeles County. Claremont is located just a five to 15 minute walk from the Pomona hospitals where John Thomas allegedly worked at. The perpetrator employed the same MO as the back in Los Angeles killer using blankets and pillows to cover the victim faces despite the existence of nearly 20 survivors. The lack of communication and collaboration between departments prevented detectives from linking the cases between the murders in Los Angeles and Claremont. Subsequently, several victims in Claremont were either connected to or suspected of being a victim of John Thomas, with one of confirmation, Isabel Q, 85 was found partially decomposed in a local vineyard near the Ontario airport on October 22nd of 1983. She had been missing from her apartment for 11 days before her daughter discovered her. Tragically, her daughter Audrey Skew met the same fate three years later when she was found strangled and sexually assaulted in June of 1986. The same apartment Additionally, it is believed that between March and April of 1986, John assaulted the two other neighbors residing in the same complex as the accused. In 1987, John entered a relationship with a new woman, while details about his previous marriage to Coletta Webb remain uncertain. March 1987, 
John became a father to a baby boy and eventually married his girlfriend in April 1989. They returned to Los Angeles where John found employment in the mailroom of the State Compensation Insurance Fund on Wilshire Boulevard near Fairfax Avenue in Glendale, California. The killing seemed to have ceased in 1989 with John's job at the state worker compensation agency. It is unclear whether this was due to a desire to settle into fatherhood or simply a result of his advancing age. However, a few years later, on July 1st, 1995, John Thomas finds himself in another wedding aisle, marrying a woman named Caroline Moret. Unfortunately for John, the Los Angeles Police Department resumed their efforts to solve the cold case murders, including those that was haunted, the Bury. With the advancement in technology, a cold case unit was formed, leading detectives to send out DNA samples from crimes that were that they were investigating. Since John was registered as a sex offender, he was legally required to provide a DNA sample, finally. Detective Diane Webb, who spearheaded the initiative known as REACT, ordered a large-scale manhunt after narrowing down the list of 92 unswapped individuals living in Los Angeles. It was Detective Webb who ultimately played a crucial role in leading to detectives to Lonnie David Franklin Jr., also known as the Grim Sleeper, rather than John Thomas. On October 8, 2008, John was requested to submit DNA tests as a part of Webb's suite. He arrived at the Los Angeles Police Department's Southwest Division dressed professionally and corroborated during the process of scraping the insides of his mouth four times. The meeting was described as uneventful, and John appeared to be a pleasant individual who would not have raised suspicion. Five months later, the DNA from John's cheek swab was matched to five killings and rapes that had occurred in 1970 and 1980. These cases share relatively unusual MOs involving the use of pillows or pillow sheets to suffocate or strangle the victims. All the victims were elderly white women and who had been raped and then strangled. This spare multiples of DNA has strongly indicated the presence of another unidentified serial killer in Los Angeles County, contrary to belief that all serial killers in the area have been identified. The following revelation, John's despicable actions shocked the department, exposing a history of violent rampage. Dating back to the 1950s, March 31st, 2009, he was publicly arrested with the co-workers and loved ones witnessing the event in 2009. John was charged with the murders of Ethel Skoloff, Elizabeth McCohen, Cora Perry, Mabel Husson, Miriam McKinley, Evelyn Bunner, Adriana Q. While it is difficult to prove in court, it is suspected that John Floyd is responsible for additional assaults and murders. What disturbed detectives further about John's arrest that he has been reciting just a few blocks away from the original sexual attacks he had committed as a young man in 1957. Detectives believed that he had manipulated the justice system and district attorney's office into treating those cases as burglaries, which was allowed him to evade responsibility for his violent acts. John Floyd Thomas was a charismatic, diabolically evil individual who preyed on vulnerable elderly individuals in Los Angeles region. He took pleasure in savagely murdering and assaulting them, growing increasingly confident to the point of returning to the same apartment complex years later to kill the child of one of his victims and cause chaos amongst the other residents. He successfully manipulated the system, deceived everyone around him. He co-workers who had known him for decades were genuinely shocked when they witnessed his arrest. John had crafted an image of a religious family man, often sending Bible quotes and spreading joy to those around him. The revelation of his true nature left his friends and family disgusted and traumatized, realizing that a monster has been close proximity the entire time, concealed in plain sight. And that, my friends, is truly terrifying.